Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Insights do happen. They are a genuine mental event. They really are responsible for the theory of gravity. In recent years, cognitive psychologists and neuroscientists have begun to probe these very mysterious mental moments. And it turns out there are two defining features of such moments of insight. The first defining feature is that the answer comes out of the blue. It arrives when we least expect it. The second defining feature is that as soon as the answer arrives, we know this is the answer. We don't have to double check the math or think through the alternatives. We know this is the solution we've been searching for. It comes attached with this sense of certainty. It feels like a revelation. It's not quite clear how one could scientifically study these moments of insight, right? Because you can't just put undergraduates in a brain scanner and say, have an epiphany, we're ready for you. That'd be a very inefficient way to collect data. So instead, what scientists have to do is come up with a way to generate lots of moments of insight on the fly. And I'm talking tonight primarily about the research of Mark Beeman at Northwestern and John Cuneos at Drexel. And what they did is they came up with a set of word problems called compound remote associate problems. I'm going to give you three words. You have to find the fourth word that can form a compound word with these three words. So the three words are pine, crab, and sauce. The answer in this case is apple. Pineapple, crab apple, applesauce. And so the first thing Beeman and Cunius discovered when they would give undergrads dozens of these compound remote associate problems inside a scanner is that in the seconds before an insight appeared, an obscure part of the brain called the anterior superior temporal gyrus, a fold of cortex in the back of your right hemisphere just behind your ear, showed a sharp spike in activity. It's a brain area nobody knows too much about. It's been previously associated with things like the processing of jokes and also the interpretation of metaphors. And this begins to make a little sense, you know, when Romeo says that Juliet is the sun, we know he's not saying that Juliet's a big flaming ball of plasma gas. Instead, we realize he's trafficking in metaphor. And the way we make sense of that metaphor is by looking past all these surface dissimilarities, the fact that Juliet and sons have literally nothing in common, and instead searching for the underlying themes, those remote associations they actually share. Now, a similar mental process is going on in your head when you're trying to make sense of pine, crab, and sauce. Those aren't three words that go together very frequently. You don't use them in a sentence very often. Yet this one brain area seems to be particularly good at finding that one other word, which in this case is apple, that binds them all together. Now what the scientists argue is that this similar mental process is also required when you solve a insight problem in the real world. That if the answer were obvious, if the connections were on the surface, you would have found it already. The fact that you can find it, that you feel frustrated and stumped and stuck, that the problem seems impossible, is a reminder that the answer probably relies, probably is going to require you to bring, to bring together a set of ideas and associations that seem to have nothing in common. So this is the first thing Beeman and Cuneos discovered is the importance of the interior superior temporal gyrus. Second thing they found is a bit more interesting. This they discovered in conjunction with researchers at UCL when they hooked students up to a EEG machine. And what they discovered is they could predict with pretty good accuracy up to eight seconds in advance whether or not someone's going to have a moment of insight. The question, of course, is what this predictive signal is. Turns out to be something called alpha waves. Like most things in the mind, alpha waves remain pretty mysterious, but they are very closely associated with states of relaxation. So things that induce lots of alpha waves are things like taking a walk on the beach, taking a walk in the park, playing ping pong, taking a long hot shower, drinking a beer on the couch. You know, whatever it is you do that allows you to stop thinking about those problems at work that you can't solve, that puts your mind at ease, chances are that's also filling your head with alpha waves. How most people think about problem solving is backwards. When you give most people a very hard problem, I think our first instinct is to drink another cup of coffee, to stay up late. But when you need a moment of insight, that's often exactly backwards. You'll be focused, but you'll be focused on the wrong answer. Instead, the next time you need an epiphany, you should take a break. You should take a shower. You should, you know, have a beer or three. Just last month, a study came out showing that when you get undergrads too drunk to drive, they actually solve 30% more of these very difficult moment of insight puzzles. <laughs> now, it would be very wonderful if I could stand up here and tell you that the way to solve every difficult creative problem is to get drunk, <laughs> is to 
take a hot shower, is to go on a relaxing walk, to pretend that alpha waves were a universal cure. But of course, we all know that's the case. We all know that, yes, creativity is about inspiration, but it's also about perspiration. In reality, all great artists and thinkers are great workers. Beethoven describes how he often goes through 70 different iterations of a single musical phrase before finding the one that works. In other words, the lesson here is that even Beethoven, the cliche of artistic genius, still needed to constantly refine his ideas, struggling with his music until the beauty shone through. Let's not sugarcoat, this rejecting process isn't fun. It's the red pen on the page and the discarded sketch. Nevertheless, such a merciless process is sometimes the only way forward. We keep on thinking and paying attention because our next thought might be the answer. So what defines this kind of creativity? What sets them apart is a character trait, a new character trait called grit. It's about single-mindedness. I'm thinking here of someone like J.K. Rowling who suffered through 12 rejections from publishers but kept on writing about that boy wizard in coffee shops while her baby daughter napped. That is grit. It is a stubborn refusal to quit. Grit allows you to practice the right way, which is not the fun way. You can ask yourself, well, which teachers are going to be able to make it through their first year of teaching in inner city public school? It turns out it's the grittiest ones. And the grittiest ones lead to the biggest boost in standardized test scores. Which students are going to be able to graduate from high school and go on to college? It's the grittiest ones, not the ones with the highest IQ scores and so on. Which entrepreneurs are going to make the most money three years out of business school? The ones with the highest levels of grit. That in field after field, grit turns out to explain the most variation in terms of why someone is successful and why someone isn't. Because grit allows us to keep on working even when it's not fun. Now, I think when it comes to creativity, grit is even more important, right? Because almost by definition, making something new in this day and age is going to be damned hard. If it were easy, it would already exist. That poem would have been written, that gadget would have been patented, that idea would already have been brought into the world. And so making it real is going to involve lots and lots of frustration and failure. It's going to involve draft after draft. It's going to involve people telling you you're not good enough, you're not cut out. It's going to involve people telling you this idea will never, ever work. It's going to involve you know, rejections from publishers. But, but in order to make it through, in order to keep on pushing, in order to make this idea real, you need grit. So far, I've been attempting to describe these two distinct forms of creativity, which depend on very distinct mental processes in the brain. The more practical lesson, though, is that different kinds of creative problems benefit from different kinds of creative thinking. So this raises the obvious question. How can we adjust our thought process to the task at hand? When should we daydream and take warm showers? And when should we drink another cup of coffee? What requires relaxation and what requires grit? The human mind has a natural ability to diagnose our problems, to assess the kind of creativity we need. These assessments have an eloquent name. They're called feelings of knowing, and they occur whenever you suspect that you can find the answer if only you keep on thinking about the question. Now, when it comes to creative problem solving, feelings of knowing turn out to be essential. This is because they are a remarkably accurate guide at telling us whether or not we can solve a problem in a given time frame. And this has been shown by Janet Metcalf and others, that when you give people a variety of different kinds of creative problems, they can identify with upwards of 85% accuracy whether or not they can solve that problem in five minutes or an hour or within a day. So they can say, yep, I can do this, or nah, this is beyond my reach right now. What makes these feelings of knowing even more useful is to become attached with a sense of progress. So as you're working on this problem you think you can solve, even though you don't know what the answer is, you're still able to say, I am making progress. I am getting closer. The solution, I'm getting warmer to the solution. So when we don't feel that we're getting closer to the answer, let's say, when there is no feeling of knowing, when we've hit the wall, then chances are we probably need an insight. In these instances, we should rely on the right hemisphere, which excels at revealing those remote associations. Focusing on the problem will be a waste of mental resources. We will stare at our computer screen and repeat our failures. Instead, what we should do is find a way to relax. The most productive thing we can do is forget all about work. However, when those feelings of knowing are present, when they are telling us we're getting closer, that we're making progress, then we need to keep on struggling. The last idea I'd like to end with today is a provocative one, and it speaks directly, I think, to the difficulty of fostering innovation. In fact, it suggests that many of the things we do with the best of intentions actually get in the way. 
they hinder our natural imagination. I think it's best demonstrated by the work of Jeffrey West, a theoretical physicist at the Santa Fe Institute. He points out that from a certain perspective, cities and companies look quite similar, right? They're both big agglomerations, big clusters of people in a fixed physical space. Yet there's one very interesting difference between cities and companies, which is that cities never die. Cities are indestructible. Cities live forever. You can nuke a city, comes back. You can flood a city, comes back. You can have a devastating earthquake and burn the city to the ground. Yet we still love San Francisco. Companies, on the other hand, are incredibly fragile. Even the biggest companies in the world, those multinational Fortune 100 firms, they only live on average for 45 years. Only two companies in the original Dow Jones Index are still around. More than 25% of Fortune 500 companies die every decade. As cities get bigger, as the metropolis swells in size, everyone in that city becomes more productive. They're going to make more money, they're going to invent more patents, invent more trademarks. By every metric we have, they're going to look better. As a company gets bigger, everyone in that company becomes less productive. They're going to bring in less profit per employee, fewer patents per employee, fewer trademarks. Everyone says, make the company bigger, grow the bottom line. So that's what they do. So, so they get this expensive bureaucracy, lots of fixed costs, but they're no longer able to innovate at the same rate. So they become more reliant on their old ideas. For the new ideas, they've got to invest in expensive acquisitions. But eventually, those old ideas no longer work. They're no longer useful, and those acquisitions don't pan out. And that's when companies go belly up. Because cities don't try to maximize creativity, they end up doing exactly that. Companies, on the other hand, they try to micromanage the process. These well-paid CEOs say, I know how to do this. I know how to you know, get the most out of my employees. So they tell you which problems to work on. They tell you who to talk to. They tell you where you can go. They tell you not to drink a beer in the afternoon. They tell you to focus, 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 to stay in your cubicle. They tell you to brainstorm when brainstorming absolutely doesn't work. And all these things, many of which are done with the best of intentions, they actually get in the way. They hold us back. The imagination has always seemed like a magic trick of matter, which is probably why we've always blamed our best ideas on the muses. The good news is that by finally understanding where our new ideas come from, we can hopefully have more of them. The science of creativity can make us just a little bit more creative. But we must also be honest. The creative process will never be easy no matter how much we know about neurons or cities. The science of the imagination doesn't fit neatly on a PowerPoint slide and it can't be summarized in a subtitle. Although the imagination is inspired by the everyday world, by its flaws and beauties, we are able to see beyond our sources, to imagine things that only exist in the mind. Twitter, I think this is a, a, an organization which was founded to be dedicated to the promotion of, of industry and the promotion of ideas and so on. And certainly in London, we have this uh, new um, initiatives to create innovation, make parts of London a, yeah. a hub for creativity and so on. Are there any sort of practical things that a city or a country can do to foster these sorts of capabilities? Yeah. It's tough. You know, creativity is a very organic, serendipitous process. It is tough to manage in a top-down fashion. Mm -hmm. um, that, that one of the tremendous virtues of a city is that a mayor is a pretty powerless figure. Um, and, and so they can't mess it up. And so I think one wants to begin with, with very modest goals and to realize that there's very little we can do, at least at the moment, you know, at least that we understand, to explicitly say if we do X, Y, and Z, we'll be able to increase patents 25% or so on. Um, that's a, I mean, I think there are general themes one can embrace. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the themes one sees when you look at very creative cities that, that have found a way to maximize innovation. Um, it has to do with density, that, that cities that maximize density, maximize those bumps, they do better. It's also, you know, diversity seems to be a you know, theme you see again and again um, in, in, you know, in very creative places. Ages of excess genius, these periods where you see the sudden flourishing of talent. Um, and it's stuff like ancient Athens, Renaissance Florence, Elizabethan England. Uh, and, and for a long time, I think we brushed aside these moments as mere accidents, that you run the tape of history forward for long enough, eventually you'll get these clottings of genius. But I think there are these recurring patterns one sees in all these periods, mm -hmm. some themes one can extract. And there are themes, for instance, that you, know, you see in England, for instance, in the 16th century, vast expansion, educational potential. So a guy like Shakespeare, whose father was a glover, signed his name with the mark. He was being given lessons in 
classic languages at the age of eight by an Oxford-educated teacher free of charge. Chris from Marlowe got a full scholarship to Cambridge. So as T.S. Eliot once put it in describing Elizabeth in England, it wasn't that there was more talent, it's that less talent was wasted. Right. Um, so the very first thing to do, the low-hanging fruit to pick, is to find a way to waste less talent to improve the educational system. You, you spoke about um, some of the techniques that, that people use, and you, and you alluded to the fact that brainstorming doesn't work yeah. at all. Now, yeah. there's probably everybody in this room has yeah. been in an internal meeting with Haribo on the table and yeah. post-it notes, and you're telling them that they've been wasting their time. No, I mean, I think, I think brainstorming can be a good morale booster. Brainstorming is the most widely implemented creativity technique of all time. It was pioneered by this ad executive named Alex Osborne, the O in BBDO. Um, in a series of best-selling business books in the late 1940s and early 50s, he outlined this technique called brainstorming, um, which, which basically there's just one rule to brainstorming, which is don't criticize. Whatever you do in a brainstorming meeting, you cannot criticize the ideas of other people, that all ideas are good ideas. And, and the assumption behind this is that the imagination is very meek and shy and fragile. And if it's worried about being criticized, it'll just clam up and it won't be able to free associate at all. Hmm. But, you know, as I said in my talk, the only problem with brainstorming is that it just doesn't work. Psychologists have known this for 60 plus years, um, that, that you know, study after study has shown that you put people in a room and tell them to brainstorm, they're going to come up with fewer ideas and less original ideas than those same people who might work by themselves. Um, so brainstorming would become less than the sum of our parts. Now, the reason brainstorming doesn't work returns us to the very first rule of brainstorming, which is thou shalt not criticize. Because as studies by Charlotte Namath have shown, uh, she's shown in others, that groups that engage in what she calls debate and dissent, where they are encouraged to engage in constructive criticism, they come up with anywhere between 25 to 40 percent more ideas, and those ideas are rated as much more original. And that's because when we don't criticize each other, when we all just pretend every idea is a good idea, we tend to float on the superficial surface of the imagination. And our free associations, all by ourselves, you know, left to their own devices, are not that interesting. So if I ask you to free associate on blue, I can predict with a high degree of accuracy that your first answer will be green, followed by ocean, sky. Then things get a little more complicated, but you'll, you may say, you know, Joni Mitchell or Miles Davis or Jeans or Smurfs, but, but nothing too profound or surprising. Um, and that's because our free associations are bound by language, and language is full of cliches. Now, the way we get past those cliches is to engage in criticism. Is, you know, that is what surprises us, that's what invigorates us, that's what wakes us up. It means we're really paying attention to the ideas of other people. It forces us to dig a little bit deeper, hmm. and that's when things get interesting.